My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to a West Coast edition of Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. I'll be with my friends. I'm just trying to make a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate, teach. Call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Look, we don't care about rate cuts. We care that the Fed's no longer the enemy. That's what this stock market's saying. The Fed kept rates steady today and gave a forecast for some rate cuts in the future. But while the Fed is important, the specifics of when we get rate cuts or how many, that's become small potatoes. The important thing is that we can afford to think about earnings again, rather than worrying endlessly about the Fed's next move. A lot of people want to play that part of the game. Not me. I prefer to try to make money in the market. And for that, the earnings are what truly matter. Remember, I am not an economist or a Fed diviner. I am a dollar sign represented by a man. And this dollar sign likes what he sees. Knowing that the Fed is our back will cut when needed. That's why the Dow gained 401 points today. S&P jumped 0.89%. NASDAQ pole vaulted 1.25% today. But the key thing is we've reached the point in the cycle where you don't need to fret about the Fed. We're so used to parsing every word from Fed Chief Jay Powell, every statement, every press conference. I said, forget that. Parse all you want. I'm going to go recommend NVIDIA. Buy some Eli Lilly for the Chapel Trust. Of course, I'm not telling you the Fed's irrelevant. Couldn't be further from the truth. But I fall squarely into the camp of the late Marty Zweig, who dispensed wisdom from his perch on the iconic Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser show. Marty always said, don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tape. That meant if the Fed was raising rates, you needed to be cautious. If the tape, the action in the stock market, was bad, and it's often bad when the Fed's tightening, then you need to be even more cautious. So long as the Fed was raising rates or just threatening to raise rates, it basically controlled the direction of the vast majority of stocks. Sure, some names could defy the Fed, but far fewer than we'd like. And then once the Fed's not raising, well, you know what? Why don't I analogize so you understand? I used to take my youngest daughter to a huge Dave and Buster's in Philly with Pop when she was little, and she had this game. She wanted me to play. I hated it. It was had a giant claw. You know, you put a quarter in, you got to direct the claw. We spent maybe 30 bucks on that stupid claw. And at most, we caught maybe, uh, I don't know, a five-inch high troll doll worth about 15 cents. Real bad risk reward. When the Fed's tightening, picking winners in the stock market is like playing with that Dave & Buster's claw. But when the Fed's done tightening, it's like the claw suddenly works. You can actually pick things up. Someone might be worth something. Something big. Now there's this whole contingent of money managers and strategists who think we can divine the Fed's next move, and that's all that matters. We can game how many rate cuts we'll get and when they'll do it, and that's what what, what we're supposed to be doing. For the most part, I think these people are charlatans now. They might as well hang out at Dave & Buster's. They're saying three cuts here, four cuts there. Please! I'm telling you, that's not important anymore. Whether it's three cuts or two cuts or one cut or even no cut, we are no longer fighting the Fed, and that is what matters. If you're not fighting the Fed, you can use that claw machine without feeling like you're constantly going to get ripped off. Of course, if the Fed stops being friendly, if Jay Powell says, whoops, we stopped tightening too soon, and now we need another rate hike, oh, then we are indeed back to where we started, shoving that 30 bucks into the claw machine, getting endless heartbreak. But the Fed didn't do that, which brings me to why I'm out here in Silicon Valley, where the money's made if there's money to be made. The process of making money in the market is something I want to exploit. I know everybody's sick of hearing about NVIDIA, unless you already bought on my recommendation and now have truly staggering gains. Some investing club members have made millions in this one. Others have happily retired from it. But I can tell you that NVIDIA's supercomputers are about to impact nearly every aspect of our lives, yours and mine, because they've reached the tipping point where artificial intelligence can be used to improve everything. Just today, you know what I did? I dropped into the Omniverse, just like that. The one I told you to look at, Jensen Wong's keynote. In that speech, Jensen joked about how he gets a kick out of stepping out of a non-existent car that he sees when the Omniverse is streamed into the Apple Vision Pro. So I put the Vision Pro on, and I gaped at a Nissan sports car. Really cool. I am telling you, it was there. I know. I fiddled with some color combinations. I checked under the hood. I looked in the trunk, kicked the tires, and of course, sat in that nice bucket seat. Smooth. I loved it. I wanted to buy it. And I said to myself, if I were a visionary car dealer, maybe a Carvana, 
I'd send a Vision Pro to anyone who's thinking about buying a car, then let them do the same thing I did. The customer would buy his car from the Vision Pro and voila, delivered to the door. Then I visited a factory floor in the Omniverse where I could make changes just looking at the assembly line. Resolution was so perfect that if I were Siemens or any other large factory builder, I'd give every engineer one of these things. Same for goes for anyone who's building ships or jet planes. Anything where something needs to be made with changes that could be expensive. Boeing desperately needs this technology. I'd make sure that all of my engineers and architects and even welders, HVAC people, had the Omniverse streamed in by the Vision Pro or something similar. They are hand in glove, I'm telling you. But does Apple know that? Can you afford to wait until they do? Right now, they're treating the Vision Pro as a consumer product when the truly transformative applications and the huge money are all about the enterprise via the Omniverse. Luckily, they had the foresight to charge $3,500. They could charge double to a Siemens or a GE or a Hyundai Heavy Industries or a Floor or a Bechtel, just to name some of the builders of gigantic projects. Remember, it only works because NVIDIA supercomputers are connected to the Omniverse, which is then fed into the Vision Pro. If I were you, I'd want to own some Apple before they go after the corporations, not just the individuals with this tremendous device. It will be worth it. Look, I don't want to get too totally hung up on tech. The orders were strong today because I got a break from the Department of Energy, which said they won't face billions of dollars in fines if they keep making a lot of gas guzzlers. Good for Ford, good for GM. Bad for the polar bears. You buy the retailers now when the economy is still strong enough and the numbers for a Dick's or a Best Buy or a Costco are strong enough. The travel stocks, they do well when people are flush, which they still are. But the bottom line is simple. When you aren't fighting the Fed, the claw picks up a lot of toys that are worth something. We aren't fighting the Fed. Get to the claw and try to grab some winners. Let's take calls. Let's start with Perros in California. Perros. Hey, Jim. Uh, thanks for visiting the Bay Area. It was um, nice to have you over here. Really appreciate it. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying out here. I don't really like New <laughs> okay. Jersey anymore. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, thank no you for allowing us to look at the market markets bottom up instead of top down. Yes. That's something I've learned from you, and I really appreciate that. It just takes a lot of time, and you can't have any sleep, but that's all right. You can sleep yeah. on Saturday. How can I help? <laughs> exactly. So um, just wanted to ask you about uh, this company. They're in the energy space. They, um, they're pretty big. They own the 76 franchise gas stations, and uh, they're doing pretty well. Just wanted to get your take on PSX, Philip 66. It's a horse, man. It's a horse. It's a terrific, terrific company. And I got to tell you, I'll give you two of them. I think Valero's great, too. Uh, yeah, the refiners have it going. All right, listen, people, we aren't fighting the Fed. That's what you need to know. So get to the claw and try to grab some winners. Man, by tonight, I'm bringing you part two of my conversation with our gracious host for these past couple of days, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Ma. Don't miss our far-reaching interview on everything from his journey to the U.S. at age nine to sovereign AI. Then the U.S. government just awarded its largest Chips Act funding yet. I'm getting all the info with the Secretary of Commerce. But first, I'm continuing my tour de force of companies in San Francisco with exclusive interviews from SoFi and Amazon Web Services. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. we do with SoFi, the digital bank with a stock that's now down 26% for the year. Now, that decline's mostly come over the last couple of weeks after the company announced a big convertible debt offering and made some exchange agreements with existing convertible debt holders that created a ton of new shares. Suddenly, investors are very worried about dilution, about their shares getting swept underwater by a flood of new stock. Now, I know many of you are frustrated about this. We, we've gotten a lot of calls about it. I feel frustrated, too, because I've championed SoFi at many points. When Craig in Florida called about this one a couple of weeks ago, I told him that I still believe in the enterprise and issued an open invitation to CEO Anthony Noto to come on, explain why the stock is still worth owning. Luckily, he accepted, so we can get right to the bottom of this. Mr. Noto, welcome back to Mad Money. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me. Okay, so, Anthony, you, you heard what I said, which is that people just feel that after the great run, and it was a great run. After the really terrific outlook you gave, after the stock was moving up, 
that you yourself hurt the stock and it went down big and people feel badly that they bought it at nine only to find out that, well, something was wrong at SoFi. Yeah, I think it's important to understand why we did the convertible okay. deals, why we did the buyback, and the benefits to shareholders that I don't think are truly understood by the market. Well, this is your chance. The first point is we did this deal from a position of strength. We just had a record 2023, over $2.1 billion of revenue, up over 30%, 40% growth in our members, our first quarter of gap profitability, over $400 million of uh, EBITDA generation, um, and gave an outlook that was going to be for full year positive gap profitability in 2024, as well as continued strong growth in our tech platform, as well as our financial okay. services business. And we're going to be more cautious on the personal loan business. Um, what we saw was an opportunity from that position of strength was to lower our cost of debt. We had two pieces of debt that were quite expensive. One we did in 2019, it is a series one preferred that pays 12.5% interest. That's so good. Five years after we issue it, we can buy it back in May. If we don't buy it back in May, we'll have to not just pay 12.5% interest, but it actually goes up to 15% interest for the next five years and we can't buy it Okay, back. so in other words, it wasn't like you could play around. If you tried to think that maybe we'll go to 12 and we got to May, you would have, and it didn't go to 12, you could have been hurt. It was not like the risk was, hey, listen, it could go up to 20 here. It was the opposite, which is that you had to get this piece done. Well, I would put it this way. We saw it as an opportunity to do it and have a negligible impact in gap earnings per share and also combined with a buyback, have it be accretive. But did you by think the stock was going to get crushed like this? Let me, let me finish. Have it be accretive to tangible book value per share by 8 to 10%. Okay. When you do a convertible, there is pressure on the stock from investors shorting the stock against the convertible right. to delta hedge. That does happen. So there is typically 5 to 10% decline. But the reason why we did it is really important because I think this is what will put some momentum back into the stock. First is we had this 12.5% debt. We also had another piece of debt that's about $500 million that we pay 7% on. So we're going to save between 40 and $60 million of interest expense a year by refinancing from 12.5% down to one and a quarter where the convert is and from 7% down to one and a quarter. So in other words, you didn't need to, do, you didn't need to raise money because you have a lot of bad loans. No, we did this to lower our cost of debt because the, we have done so well as a company, we can now issue debt at 1.25%, retire the 12.5% debt and the 7% debt. Now, we also bought back a convertible that we issued in 2021. In the fourth quarter, we bought $90 million back of that convertible. Someone approached us and was willing to sell it to us at 78 cents on the dollar. Well, as our business continued to do better, the convertible kept going up, and it was in the mid-80s. And what we decided to do was buy back $600 million of that convertible at 88% of the face value because we'd have to refinance that in 2026. There was $1.1 billion of that outstanding. By buying it back, it actually was accretive to book value per share, but tangible like, book value per I share. I could read things and say that there's even more stock coming from SoFi, that they may not be done. It's completely false. Let me explain why. The interest expense is going to be captured when we refinance that. That's a known thing, 40 to $60 million. The buyback of the $600 million convertible, we are issuing stock, but we're doing it below the value on those convertibles, and therefore that transaction is 8 to 10% accretive on tangible book value per share. So yes, there's stock being issued, but the actual value on the tangible book basis per share is going up by 8 to 10%. But this market has not been defined by that, because if you take a look, Citi's tangible book value is dramatically higher than its stock. People want earnings per share. They want to have growth. They want fintech to be providing the growth. Exactly. They would like it to be 50-50, as you said it might be. They want the brokerage business to do well, yeah. and they don't want you to make a lot of loans if things are loans go bad versus so you, fintech. You hit the nail on the head of what we're doing. They're okay. going to still get the growth from us, driven by our tech platform growing 20%, and our financial services business growing 75%, and not growing the borrow business. So they'll get that same growth and a negligible impact on the gap EPS from this deal, and 8 to 10% accretive on a tangible book value per share basis. So we, they can have their cake and eat it too with SoFi. Okay, that's important. But now there are a lot of people say, well, you know, Jim, you like SoFi. You didn't like Robinhood that much. Robinhood has crypto. SoFi, no crypto. Why don't you have crypto? We don't because we're a nationally chartered bank in our deposit business, and that's not permissible. Our deposit business, our checking and savings account business, which we call SoFi Money, doing extraordinarily well. The strategy has played out tremendously well. We continue to have record deposit growth. Um, 90% of our deposits are from direct deposit customers, which means we're their primary relationship. Um, in addition to that, 97% of our deposits are insured. So super high quality deposit base that funds our loans at higher margins and better returns. That's how we hit gap profitability in the fourth quarter and hit our long-term EBITDA margins of 30%. 
So it's all working together fundamentally. And now we've improved the balance sheet. One thing I forgot to mention about the buyback of the convertible, not only is it accretive at 8 to 10% on a tangible book value per share basis, if we had done it in cash, it would not have been. In addition, by doing it in stock, we increase our capital ratio to 17.3% if you pro forma the fourth quarter from 15.3. We only need to be at 10.5%. There's such a huge cushion now in our capital ratios, it allows us to navigate whatever's in front of us. All right, last question. Is it possible for you to go on the road to large institutions and explain to them what you just said to me? Because some of the parts, $7, tangible book, earnings go up, no worries about bad loans. The stock should not be at seven, Anthony. Yeah, since we did the convertible, there was definitely pressure from people but, doing the but Delta But big hedge. institutions would understand that. A- absolutely. But at that same point in time, there started to be grave concerns about interest rates and what the Fed would do. The clarity we saw from the Fed today, today. drove a big increase. But between today and three weeks ago was the period of time where people weren't sure, is it going to be higher for longer? Are we cutting rates in May? Maybe June. So that uncertainty weighed on the stock as well. Fair enough. I'm glad you came on. That speaks louder than anything else you could do. Absolutely. Thank Th- you, Jim. Thank you, Anthony Noto, who's the CEO of SoFi. Mad Money's back in. Coming up, more from San Francisco with the man of the hour. Chips, AI, and much more. Stick with Kramer. here in the Bay Area to speak for NVIDIA's GPU technology conference, the Festival of Artificial Intelligence. Yesterday, I got a chance to speak with the man behind it all, Jensen Wong, co-founder, president, and CEO of NVIDIA, or as I like to call him, the modern day Da Vinci. When you speak to a CEO who spurred on a new industrial revolution, created so much value for shareholders, NVIDIA's up more than 30,000% since the first time he came on the show. You want to learn everything you can. Here's part two of our conversation with the man of the hour, Jensen Wong. Jensen. Eight billion people did not get a degree in computer science. What are you doing to democratize this world? We're going to make computers smarter so that they don't have to learn computer science to program a computer. The computer should just understand what we want and what we intend. But we say, Let's, please help me build a factory that can make the best cars. It can well, do that? It, it, it surely will help a lot. And the reason for that is because you give it a plan, you tell it, um, what are the type of parts that you like to put into it? Uh, eventually, this factory will be a robot that's orchestrating a bunch of manufacturing robots that are building cars that are going to be robotic. And, and why do robots look like people? Well, robots look like people because a couple of reasons. Uh, first reason, the most important reason, is that we built the world for ourselves. And so the workstations of a factory, the manufacturing line of a factory was really created for people. And that's the most important reason. The second most important reason is that we have, to, we have to teach a robot how to be a productive robot. And you need data for that. We're in a world where in order to write a software for a computer, we use data or training examples and the computer learns from the examples. Well, we have the most examples of human moving around right. of just about any other form of data. Now, and when so, you thought of this, were you at a... a were you at Denny's sitting around with some people and saying, you know what, we can do this. It may take 20 years, 30 years, but we're going to do this. When did you think of this? Well, uh, we started the company in 1993. And our big idea was uh, acceleration. Accelerating the work that CPUs are not good at. And if we, if we take that work that the CPU is not good at, and we offload it to something that is incredibly good at it, we can make the overall computer more efficient. That was the big idea. But that was for a game. Well, game was the first application. Okay, okay. Game was just the first application. Okay, that's a mistake. A lot of people just say, you were a gamer. No, you had this idea. We were so good at making that chip for games that people thought we were a game company. Intel thought you were a game company. I know that you presented there. We were happy that anybody thinks of us at all. And, and uh, we were so good at it. And in fact, NVIDIA is the world's best game technology chip company today. There's, it's, there's the, we have, I'm so proud of the work that we do there. And, you know, as you know, games kind of a simulation of the virtual world. And so but because of this, yeah. because of the whole thing from Denny's all the way, somehow you are still the underdog. You that you are 
hungry. You make it feel like your company's going to go out of business in 30 days. You know, Jim, that's probably something just related to upbringing. You know, I, I, uh, I, you know, we, we grew up, we grew up working hard. My parents worked hard. Um, we're immigrants. You arrived uh, here with, before them when you were nine. Yeah, yeah. And so my older brother brought me to the United States. He was 10. And so, so we had a 10 year old bring a nine year old to the United States. And, and, uh, and so we, we, uh, we had, we had quite a great life, you know, and, but we had to work for it and we were immigrants and we took nothing for granted. And, uh, my parents work incredibly hard. They work incredibly hard today. And so, so and I, your, I think that that part kids, of my DNA. Are they hard workers? Well, they, they work super hard. And where, what divisions are they in? I have two kids. They both work at NVIDIA. It took me a decade to convince them to come work here. Uh, they, they're, they're, uh, they, they, you know, they wanted, they wanted to go do their own thing. And they want to be a chef? Uh, one wanted to be a world-class chef and one wanted to be in marketing and, and, uh, and an artist. And um, uh, so, but n now both of them are, are here. One's in marketing and one's an engineer. And so it's really terrific. They can engineer the best cake ever. Spencer is in, Spencer is in uh, robotics and Madison is in Omniverse. And so they're doing amazing work. Okay, so are your, well, Blackwell, is the, are these the most expensive things on earth? Well, this, this, uh, this chip is the heart of the Blackwell system. Okay. And this is the largest chip the world's ever made. This is made at TSMC, TSMC's four nanometer process. And it is so large, we had to take two of the largest chips in the world and connect them together into one giant chip. And um, so that's the Blackwell chip. That chip goes into the Blackwell computer. And this computer, the R&D budget is about $10 billion. It took us you know, about three years or so to make. And what goes into this is supported by a whole bunch of unbelievable networking and high-speed I.O. and mountains of software, and it goes into a data center, and this data center becomes an artificial intelligence factory, and it produces artificial intelligence. Well, can we safely say that uh, if we wanted to have, let's say, a thousand incredibly smart people at our company, that they would not be collectively even as smart as that? Well, it, it depends on the type of smartness. Okay. The, yeah. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is, is uh, good at emulating, emulating us. Okay. And so uh, it emulated how we read. And it, it emulates, in order to emulate how we read and finish sentences and summarize paragraphs, it had to understand what it read. And so okay. in order to emulate us, it had to understand words. Well, okay, so I visit you six years ago, five years ago. Uh, it, it's obvious to me when you show me the dog picking up the jello and then you reward the dog that this is, I'm seeing something special. I'm painting a Cezanne seascape. It was so obvious, but it took ChatGPT for everybody to know? Well, ChatGPT is quite an amazing breakthrough. You know the open AI engineers and scientists. There, but it's based on this. Yeah, it's it's. We, we were. I'm I'm uh, very proud that Nvidia's computers made it possible for ChatGPT to be possible. But their their researchers did just unbelievable work. Yeah. Now, one of the things that does concern me is we're not perfect yet. I went to Microsoft's Copilot and I asked who your best partner is, and it said your best partner is Intel. I don't think that's true. Intel's a great partner. Oh. <laughs> Intel's a great partner. Uh, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, who isn't a great partner? Well, we who do we with, have to convince? We work with just about everybody, you know? NVIDIA, and, NVIDIA here, here's, here's what, NVIDIA is a market maker, not share taker. Okay. We create markets. Uh, everything right. that we do uh, didn't exist before. But then why are people, some people so scared, so scared of AI, so have public fear that this is going to, what, make them so they don't have a job? It's, this is going to create jobs. This is gonna create jobs. It's gonna make companies more productive. When companies are more productive, their earnings improve or their revenues go up. When that happens, they hire more people. Well, that's, an, that's yeah. called an industrial revolution. That's right. That's what the loom was. That's, that's what right. the steam engine it was. It made companies more productive, created more jobs, and made the economy larger. Is there a CPU that, it sh that that should withstand it, or wouldn't we want everything? Don't we want this in our PC? I know we don't have it yet, but don't we want this ourselves in a consumer fashion, not just business to business, uh, uh, not just enterprise? Absolutely, absolutely. Every device will have 
will run artificial intelligence software. The question is, are they small software or larger software or gigantic, gigantic artificial intelligence well, software? I listen to you and I wonder, won't there be an arms race? We're not friendly with every country in the world. Won't other countries say, you know what, we have to create our own Blackwell and compete or else be left behind uh, because we shouldn't necessarily share what we have as a country. The most important thing that countries have to do is to create their own intelligence. Okay. There's mount, sovereign AI. There's, they have to do their own sovereign AI. And the reason for that is very simple. They have a lot of data that belongs to their country. It's their natural resource. It's of their people, of their language, of their culture. So we want to encourage their China to do this. China sh China's going to do their own anyways. Um, but uh, we sh every single country should harvest, should process the data of their culture and turn it into intelligence that their own society can use. Sweden's already doing this. India's working on doing this. Japan is working on doing this. I think every country should do their own and make sure that they own their own intelligence. So there's no hegemony of the United States, and which we, would be terrible. And, but we, most importantly, it's because the data belongs to the people. It's their national assets, their national resources. Um, it could, be, it could have, of course, be combined and shared with everybody else. Um, but we're happy to, to provide the hardware that helps everybody do that. Um, but it's really important that all of the countries uh, create their own sovereign AI. Tune in tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern for a special presentation, CBC Leaders, featuring Jensen Wong. This is a rare glimpse into the man behind NVIDIA and one of the world's most innovative minds. Mad Money's back after the break. Coming up, say yes to AWS. Kramer has a deep dive into the engine that's powered Amazon and more. Next. We're here in Silicon Valley for NVIDIA's GTC event, in large part because I want you to understand the scale of the artificial intelligence revolution, which means we need to talk about who's buying these super high-end chips for generative AI and inference. One of the biggest buyers, Amazon Web Services, AWS for short, Amazon.com's cloud infrastructure division. Earlier this week, we found out that AWS is working with NVIDIA to use their newest Blackwell chips. Throw in Amazon Web Services infrastructure, and you've got practically everything you need to build up and train a brilliant artificial intelligence model as fast as possible. So let's check in with Adam Slipsky. He is the CEO of Amazon Web Services to get a better read on the situation. Adam, welcome back to Mad Money. Jim, so good to be with you again. Look, Adam, you're the guy who can really explain this. That We hear about all this raw power from Blackwell and all the different de devices that they've got and your partnership. I've seen your videos with Jensen. Could you please explain what it really means for customers of Amazon Web Services if you get a lot of this new uh, of Blackwell and all the other new parts of the platform? Uh, well, sure, Jim. So uh, Amazon is investing tremendously in all areas of AI from uh, Amazon Q, our, our uh, AI-powered digital assistant, to uh, Amazon Bedrock, our uh, managed uh, service for accessing many, many different leading models, and of course, down to the chips, uh, our own design chips, as well as our long-standing partnership with NVIDIA, which goes back 13 years, and we've been the first to bring really every uh, uh, NVIDIA chip uh, to the cloud. So we're really pleased to be partnering with NVIDIA to bring uh, uh, the Blackwell uh, platform to the cloud as well. And uh, it will be powering uh, next generation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, EC2 servers uh, and other Amazon ser AWS services, which is going to enable customers to build bigger models, to do inference uh, uh, more quickly and more powerfully, and to help drive, uh, along with all of our other efforts, yeah, a ton of different uh, new applications. Okay, so let's take a, a couple. I know you have a relationship with uh, Amgen. A relationship with Merck. Could you use NVIDIA and your own, uh, your, your own presence to be able to help these two great companies come up with new drugs? So, uh, absolutely. So uh, we have, uh, if you take our, our Amazon Bedrock service where customers access the model of their choice securely uh, with a great flexibility, we have well over 10,000 customers already using uh, Bedrock, even though it only uh, launched GA in the, in the late fall. And uh, a lot of those actually are uh, drug and life sciences companies. And we're seeing uh, basic research being done uh, uh, it, it, with, with our AI services, including Bedrock, as well as the whole uh, clinical trial and drug development process. And uh, one, one great example is Pfizer, 
um, who was using our AI services th throughout the company. And they actually estimate, they've got almost 20 different proofs of concept running on us, just in generative AI alone. And they're estimating that those efforts are gonna save between 750 million and a billion dollars annually. Oh, that's fabulous because they made an acquisition for uh, that is going to, if they have good luck, go after some of the hardest cancers. And I'm sure they need you guys to be able to just do iteration after iteration. I also want to talk about something else that you're invested in that I use. Uh, you've got a stake in Anthropic. I, I've been using this Claude 3. You know, look, ChatGPT seems a little robotic to me. Uh, the Gemini seems a little bullet point to me. But yours. Anthropic, which you're related to, uh, it seems human. It, it, it's, it, it seems also more accurate. Is that possible? Well, the new models from Anthropic, from uh, Claude 3, uh, which were just announced uh, uh, very recently in the, in the past several weeks, uh, are really leading edge, uh, a th third-party independent benchmark are showing them in the categories that they're uh, uh, trying to be involved, that they are you know, the industry leaders currently, uh, outperforming GPT-4 in areas like reasoning and math and coding. Uh, we've partnered very tightly with Anthropic, as you said. Amazon's invested uh, in Anthropic financially. More importantly, uh, we're working tightly together. AWS is the preferred cloud provider for Anthropic's mission-critical workloads. Uh, we work with them to improve their models. Uh, they work with us to improve our uh, own custom silicon, our, our Tranium and Inferentia uh, chips, which uh, are going to have such great performance in the in the months and years to come. Now, uh, I actually had Andy Jassy on once when he was at Amazon Web Services running, and he told me that they cut price every year, that people think that Amazon makes so much money, but their main thing that they like to do is give the customers a lower price constantly. Are you guys doing that still? Well, we continue to uh, drive down our own costs and then to turn around and uh, drive down uh, the price that we charge. Uh, and we've been doing that for the 18 years we've been serving customers, and we tend to, uh, to keep on doing that. And, uh, you know, it's proven to be a good business model. We've uh, really a small percentage of IT has moved to the cloud so far, and there's a lot more to come. And uh, the more attractive we can make it and the more we can make it a no-brainer for people to see that not only are you more secure in the cloud, not only do you have better operational performance, not only are you more flexible and more agile, but it's also lower cost. Uh, the more the, the more obvious it becomes. And, and I think that's why so many uh, companies and organizations are still uh, just getting into the meat of their enterprise migrations. Well, I mean, I, I, one of the things I saw, there's an article that I'm reading says AWS wants 99% of the AI market. That seems like hubris. Is it possible to keep taking share, though? I think we're all just getting started with generative AI. This is the very beginning uh, of, uh, of, of a big wa wave. Uh, I think most applications that we all interact with, whether it's at work or at home, are going to be fundamentally transformed. And uh, we're investing tremendously in, in many, many different areas of AI. But uh, it, regarding what you alluded to, you know, it, it is uh, just one facet of AWS's business. You know, we're, we're uh, approaching $100 billion a year uh, revenue run rate. Uh, last quarter, uh, we, we showed revenue acceleration, uh, which is really, uh, uh, really great. And we are seeing really positive, optimistic signs. We see less cost optimization or cost cutting efforts by our enterprise customers. Uh, we see a lot of those companies starting to lean back into their core application, core IT estate migrations back into the cloud. And we see generative AI layering in, in on all of that. So we're quite optimistic about uh, uh, the, the, the future growth potential for AWS. That's Adam Slipsky, CEO of Amazon Web Services. When we return, master the markets one stock at a time. The lightning round is up next. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready, Ski Daddy? Talk to the lightning round. Okay, everybody, I'm going to start with Mike in Pennsylvania. Mike. Booyah, Jim. Booyah. 
I'm calling about uh, Shopify. It seemed like they were parabolic years ago. Uh, just wondering what the future might hold for this company. Well, look, I like e-commerce. It's, I, I like Amazon more than Shopify, but I think Shopify does an absolutely perfect job with small, medium-sized businesses, some super packaged goods companies. I would stick by it. Let's go to Jeremy in New York. Jeremy. Booyah, Jim. Booyah. Booyah, okay. Listen, I've been looking into Capital One recently, and, I, and I've seen that they're buying Discover. And I'm wondering if it's a good buy. I heard that Warren Buffett. Wanted uh, Capital to One is terrific. Um, Capital One is terrific. Management is great. The buy, if they get, are they able to close on that Discover, would be amazing. I say stick with that one. It is a good company. Let's go to Jason in Texas. Jason. Hey, hey Kramer. First of all, I going? want to say uh, I'm going to do an anagram of Booyah, and I'm going to do an anagram and say, Hey, you be the man. Okay. And, uh, I, uh, I'm i asking about a stock of Palantir, TLTR. I like and Palantir, I'll- though. I liked the quarter last time. I, once again, we'll invite Carp on. I mean, I, got, I like the guy. I think it's a good company. Let's go to Bob in Illinois. Bob. Hello, Jim. How are you today? I am good, Bob. How about you? Good, good. Um, what do you think about Kava? It's surged. Recently. Look, we think we have a very, you know, go, Ben Stuttle and I go, I mean, we have been very clear on Kava. It got too hot, and then it came all the way down, and we said bye, 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 and it's been right, and we're sticking with it. But don't forget, Chipotle is the king. Let's go to Ian in California. Ian. Hey, Jim. Nice to hear your voice again. I'm calling about a very interesting uh, new AI pure play stock that just started trading last week. Uh, Comparable to SoundHound, but cheaper and seems like much better technology. The symbol is BNAI, Boy Nancy Alfred Indian. Would love you. There's a lot of AI pretenders. There's one AI king, and that happens to be NVIDIA, and that's the one I'm sticking with. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of the Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Coming up, D.C. has plenty of skin in the A.I. game. It's a cabinet-level confab on the White House approach to the new tech. Next. Today, we learned about the largest semiconductor subsidy to date since the passage of the CHIPS Act back in the summer of 2022. This time, the government's awarding an $8.5 billion grant to Intel to support its $100 billion of investments in domestic semiconductor manufacturing and R&D. Investments spread across four states, including two new foundries in Arizona and Ohio. Now that the CHIPS Act is truly kicking in, it's worth taking a closer look with the person who spearheaded the whole thing, Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. I got a chance to speak with her yesterday. Take a look. So, Madam Secretary, tell us about your announcement. Big announcement, Jim. Uh, I'll be with the president tomorrow in Arizona. Uh, We're making an eight and a half billion dollar grant available to Intel to expand. They'll be expanding uh, eight facilities in four states doing leading edge manufacturing right here in the United States. It's it's huge. It's a huge announcement, create tens of thousands of jobs. And most importantly, Jim, you're there at NVIDIA. You talk about AI. The United States of America is getting back into the business of leading in semiconductor manufacturing. So tell me, who will use these chips once they're made? Uh, Whoever needs them. I mean, as you know, it takes 10, 20,000 leading edge chips to train a frontier AI model. So, you know, Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, uh, you know, uh, military equipment, auto companies. I mean, chips are everywhere. Anything digital requires chips, as you well know. And these chips will be, they're really ubiquitous now, which is why we need them to be made in the United States. Absolutely. I, I wanted to point that out because I think a lot of people feel that perhaps uh, you're, tra- you're picking these companies, I don't know, more or less at random. But I bumped into an old friend of mine, Brad Koenig, who works for you. He used to head global tech for Goldman. They're telling me there's a process where you literally are talking to Amazon. You're talking to Alphabet. You're talking to Apple. You're talking to everybody all the time to find out what they need. These are not chips that are going to sit in some closet when they're done. 
Absolutely. Uh, the demand for chips is growing every day. Uh, artificial intelligence is a huge consumer of chips. You know, data centers require thousands of chips. Uh, even your car, you know, Jim, uh, connected vehicles, electric vehicles, it's over a thousand chips in every car. Uh, your, your iPhone, I mean, uh, we have spent a huge amount of time with the customers, exactly all the customers you've said, plus industrial customers, plus military, plus auto. Uh, the one thing I don't worry about is chip demand. Okay, now, I think that we all are concerned that we're an expensive place to make things. Uh, that's just known, it's cheaper in Taiwan. Uh, if you can just point out, would these factories, would these fabs be done without this, uh, w w without some of these supplements? Meaning that we are so expensive that, that you, typically you would not get a return on investment your first four or five years. So therefore, without Commerce's help, these plants would not be made here. That's exactly right. They would be built, but they would be built in Taiwan or Malaysia or Southeast Asia. And that's why we need this program, Jim. Right now, the United States of America produces zero leading edge chips in the United States. We buy 92% from one company in Taiwan. That is not resilient. That is not safe, right? That is an overly concentrated supply chain for a critical item. And that's why it makes sense for the US government to provide these subsidies so that these companies make it in America. And exactly as you said, it's more expensive here. Everything's more expensive here, higher standards. And so that's why it makes sense for the government to do this. It's a national security issue. It's not just economic security. One last question. We know that you have said that there are certain chips, particularly made by NVIDIA and made by AMD, are fastest chips the GPUs that you do not want the Chinese to have, and so you've held them back. Will we be making those kinds of chips here in our country? The fastest, the best, accelerated computing and generative AI? 100%. We have to and we will. Well, look, that's exactly what America needs, and I don't think there's really any price you can put on that, although I know you have to because you are indeed the Secretary of Commerce. Gina Raimondo, thank you so much for coming on Mad Money. Thanks, Jim. I like to say there's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to try to find it just for you right here on Mad Money. I'm Jim Cramer. See you tomorrow. Last call starts now. All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warn its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.